I, it's a stereotype, right? It's a stereotype. Simon, don't lean into stereotypes. It's not nice. It's not nice. Do it. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Try and start that better. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome. What happens here? One of my writers, in this case, Kevin, writes me a script. Y2K, the doomsday event that definitely happens. Was this about, like, where the computers, they were like, oh, all the computers are going to stop working because they can't deal with the year 2000. That's so stupid. And then I think I made fun of this. And then someone in the comments was like, actually, I was a computer programmer back in the day, and this was a big thing, and we had to go around and change all the computers. Otherwise, it would have been a big problem. It's like, oh, holy shit, okay. So I'm not sure. I don't really know what the truth is. Can you trust a random YouTube commenter? Most of the time, surprisingly, yes. I mean, oftentimes people, like, what I really like about my videos is people will chime in and they'll be like, oh, I want to expand on that. Or you got that slightly wrong. Or this is also interesting. And I'm like, holy shit, people are smart. And generally, it's correct. <laughs> I may be an idiot, but I'm not stupid. I'll never forget the tragic events that took place at midnight on January the 1st, 2000. We had been warned for years about the seemingly inevitable doomsday that was bearing down on us, but I was just a dumb teenager who refused to take it seriously. It was predicted that when the clock struck midnight, the entire world would fall into chaos. We had given too much control of our society over to our computers, and we were about to pay the price for our hubris. Is giving the things over, is giving control of shit over to computers hubris? I'd say that's the opposite of hubris. It's like, I'm a bit shit at this. Like, traffic lights. If humans were running traffic lights, they're like turning these things, there'd be loads of crashes because like, John, I twisted it, you fuck. And John would be like, and they'd just crash into each other. So I'd say it's like not hubris. It's like when a computer does something for me, I'm like, well, it's because I'm shit at it. Like, <laughs> calculating in Excel, keeping track of things, doing most tasks these days. And I feel like even more tasks in the future because of chat GPT and like that. Pretty crazy, right? I'd say it's anti-hubris. And the price was going to be high. As our computer overlords turned the clock back to the year 1900, we'd all cease to exist. Figuratively, there would be no records of our births and no social security numbers. Our bank balances would all be erased and planes would fall out of the sky. It was estimated that the damage caused by this disaster could cost up to $600 billion to fix, which is over a trillion dollars today. Um, it's, everything's fine. I was only 17 years old. Oh yeah, Kevin's a little bit older than me. When I was like 13, 12, I was 12 years old. 12 years old, five. Kevin's five years older than me. How about that? Kevin's 40. Oh, I remember this. I think Kevin told me this or something or he read it in a script. Kevin and I have a weird relationship where I learn about him through these scripts and then he watches these videos, probably learns a little bit about me. What a weird relationship. <laughs> I was only 17 years old and in my final year of high school at the time, but I was unafraid. I had already survived multiple alleged doomsday prophecies, so why should this one be any different? Besides, my father did computer stuff for social security and he seemed to think everything would be fine, so I didn't see any reason for concern. Surely this was some overblown media nonsense and nothing would happen. On New Year's Eve, I went to a party at my friend's apartment building. The bottom floor of the building had a common area that was perfect for such events and it even had a TV so we could watch the ball drop. It was... People have this? This is like not a university. It's just like a, there's a common area with a TV in a regular apartment building. <laughs> That's super weird. The only common area in my apartment building is the post boxes and the place where we keep the push chairs, the strollers for Americans. Um, that's weird. But we had common areas at university and school and stuff, play some pool. There was even a bar at university, which was nice. It was cheap. As midnight approached, we all gathered round to watch the festivities taking place in Times Square and count down along with Dick Clark and the televised crowd. Ah, Dick Clark. He's like the American Jules Holland. <laughs> Jules Holland is the, at least he was when I was a kid. I don't know if he is today, but he's like the guy who does the, the New Year's thing on the TV and something like that. <laughs> we all yelled in unison, three, two, one, happy new year. And then there was darkness. The lights went out, the TV flickered off, and even the hum of the refrigerator motor went silent. We stood there in shocked silence, unable to believe that the power grid had really gone down. I've got a bad feeling about this. And then after about 30 seconds of anxiety, my friend who lived in the building flipped the circuit breaker back on and came back into the room laughing. <laughs> oh, he's just doing a prank. That's amazing. <laughs> in the end, our lives had been completely unaffected, though this was not the case for everyone. People's lives were mostly unaffected, but Y2K did result in a few inconvenient hiccups around the world. But I suppose I'm getting ahead of myself. While I'm guessing the viewer demographics for this channel skew a bit older, uh, the viewer demo actually no, the viewer demographics of this channel are mostly 18 to 35 year olds. Hello, friends. I know there are, of course, 
course, people are going to be in the comments like, Simon, I'm 106. And it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you're an outlier. It's like the biggest demo is 18 to 35. And uh, I am a now a 36-year-old man, so I'm no longer in my own demo. It was my birthday last week. Get it all. 36? 1987. So I never used to believe that people would lose track of how old they were. And now I'm just thinking, am I actually 36? And the answer is yes. I was there, Gandalf. I was there 3,000 years ago. There are undoubtedly some of you that have absolutely no idea what the f*** I'm talking about. So let's start by addressing the obvious question. What was the Y2K bug? Back in the olden times, computers were really expensive. In the 1950s and 60s, one bit of RAM cost $1. Eight, one bit of RAM, eight bits in a byte, a thousand bytes in a kilobyte, a thousand kilobytes in a megabyte. Holy shit, that's expensive. That's like, what? Eight million dollars for a megabyte? Is that actually possible? A computer with a single megabyte of RAM, here we go, something that wasn't even possible until the 1970s would have cost, oh, a million dollars. Okay, I don't know where my maths went wrong. Um, in RAM alone, obviously, this meant that conserving memory and disk storage was going to be crucially important, so corners needed to be cut. If you're old enough to have learned how to write on a typewriter rather than a computer, which I am not, then you probably know that it is proper to type two spaces after the end of a sentence. You know what I am old enough to remember, though? A time when my mum used to work in, funnily enough, also social services. Um, and I swear to God, they had typewriters at work. And this must have been like the early 90s. So I guess they were just like, because they're government, they're just like super behind. But I swear to God, she used a typewriter. My grandma used a typewriter. She got a computer way later in life, but was still using the typewriter. What the f***? Uh, that makes me feel old. <laughs> that makes me feel real old. Because you're like, in Mad Men, in the 60s, they were using, like, typewriters. But then they got onto... Did they get into computers? No, they got a computer at, like, Mad Men office. Right. But not... They weren't using them, like, for word processing. This was standard practice for a hundred years until computers started to become more available. Using a computer or word processor was great because it was easy to make changes or corrections to something that was already typed, but long-standing conventions needed to be changed. All those extra spaces people were typing weren't free, so they had to go. It was too expensive, and it was using up the limited storage space the computers had available at the time. Fuck Microsoft! Okay. Fuck. Do I remember that right? Yeah, back in the day. I remember first co first computers, you couldn't have spaces in file names. Is that oh, for f sake? Why? It just makes it very hard to read. But relevant to the topic of Y2K were the dates. It was the 1900s and everybody knew it. Why would people waste all of this storage space saving all the dates as 19, whatever, when the last two digits of the year would be good enough? People normally only use two digits when writing dates anyway, so it seemed totally natural to shortcut things. This is how computers started storing dates in the 1950s, and it was going to be fine for the foreseeable future. The only person who showed any concern was IBM computer scientist Bob Beamer. Buzzkill Bob, am I right? Bob was able to identify in 1958 that this was eventually going to be a problem. Computers weren't just using it. It's not a problem for you, though, Bob. You'll be dead. I mean, or old. You'll be really, you'll be retired. Let's just say that. Using dates to catalog and organize information, these dates would be used for various calculations by programs. What was going to happen in the year 2000 when the date went from 1231.99 to 1100? Oh yeah, 12, 30. Americans, why do you do the date backwards? It's stupid. You're like, month, day, year. Makes no sense. There's like, look, you're right on many things, America. Why the f*** do we spell theatre in the UK? Theatra. I don't know. Or centre, centra. We do the R C E N T R E T E T H E A T R E. It's f***ing stupid. No doubt about it. The date, though, America. It doesn't make sense to do month, day, year. That's like medium length, short length, long length. Day, month, year. What the f America? Why do you have to confuse everyone? Your intellect is as weak as your dollar. Failure is your destiny. You disrespect yourself and your nation. For about 20 years, Bob tried to get people to listen to his concerns, but everybody just called him a nerd. Buzzkill Bob. Ah, oh, Buzzkill Bob. Uh, call him in and told him to shut the f 
cop. Sure, they could try and fix the problem now, but why bother? Some of his colleagues would have been born before the invention of the airplane, and they just saw Sputnik launch into space only 50 years late, 54 years later. Technology was improving at an incredible pace, so they assumed there was no way that banks or corporations would still be using the same computers decades after they were first purchased. I remember there was a problem, like, when... Because after a while, like, companies just stopped supporting software, right? And there was some point where Microsoft stopped supporting Windows XP. Because it was like, bro, it's 20 years old. We're not going to support it anymore. And there were still, like, thousands of cash machines. Uh, ATMs? What do Americans call these things? I know they have a different name. The, 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 the machine where you go to get money, you put your card in, it gives you bills. You know? Um, and they were still all running, like, Windows XP. <laughs> And it, like, if they don't have the security support, it's going to be a huge issue at some point. But they were wrong, and very wrong. These organizations began using computers in the 1960s, and by the 1990s, a lot of them hadn't bothered to upgrade. Companies felt that the 30-year-old computers they were still work were still working fine, so what was the point? Replacing all the computers at a company would be expensive by itself, and then they'd have to pay to get upgraded software as well. And back then, there probably weren't a lot of off-the-shelf options available, so they'd need to pay Ross Perot to build them a new system for the from the ground up. Who the f**k's Ross Perot? <laughs> it just didn't seem like it was worth the investment until the mid to late 90s hit. Suddenly, this wasn't a future anymore. The entire world was going to need a complete software overhaul, and they were running out of time. This is one of the, there's an interesting thing that just happened in my life. I mean, it's interesting to me. Shut up and get to the point! So, like, my family owned, or we owned, we sold it, but like a, like a beach house. And in front of it, there's like the garden, and then the beach, and then there's the sea. Obviously. We owned the house, and it was bought by like my great grandparents or grandma is like in the family forever and when they bought the house like my great grandparents or whatever they had this uh there was a company that owns like half the garden and it was like this hundred year lease thing or whatever or like 80 year lease <laughs> and they were just like yeah that's fine you know that's a don't even think about it. it's like 80 years in the future the problem is now like my family were dealing with it because it expires in 20 years and the company that i'm not going to say how much money it was because it was a lot it was a lot of money and they were like uh yeah if you um if you want to buy that from us you can you got 20 more years on it at, or those 20 years will expire and then we're going to take half your garden and this had happened to other people who have these houses by the beach and they would build like these beach huts in front of it where people can stay and like rent them for like the day or for like the evening and stuff so you don't have like your view of the sea instead you've got a view of people renting a beach hut I realize this this sounds like a massive first world problem right now but it's just like it was a, it was like this thing of not thinking about the future because it's like so long away and uh, so that was very very expensive <laughs> but we sold the the house so I mean it, it was sort of like it wasn't expensive for us but it wasn't a way because it affected the value of the property blah 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 but the person who bought it ended up buying it or some shit like that I don't know it was it was a, it was a headache not for me I didn't have to deal with it much, but my dad complained to me a lot about it, so I was listening to him talk about it. <laughs> Fascinating tangent, Simon. Let's carry on. <laughs> because when the clock struck midnight... Oh my god, that was a tangent. Because when the clock struck midnight in the year 1999 turned over to 2000, there was no telling what might happen. Well, more accurately, there was no knowing what might happen, but there was going to be an awful lot of telling what might happen from people the public trusted. What, that, what was that sentence, Kevin? Media sensationalism. I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes the media might exaggerate things to get people's attention and keep more eyes on their news channels. And that is exactly what happened in the years leading up to 2000. Absolutely nobody knew what was going to happen if the issue wasn't addressed, and it was hard for experts to even guess. The media dubbed it the Y2K bug, and they began fear-mongering as soon as they could. It didn't help that this was taking place immediately after the birth of the 24-hour news cycle and an increase in number of cable news networks. This isn't to say that none of the concerns they raised were real. For example, banks generally compound interest daily, although there are though some are monthly. Either way, January the 1st is a date that interest would be calculated, and there was a real possibility that people's savings accounts were going to reflect negative negative 100 years worth of interest. <laughs> Oh no, where's my money gone? Do you have any money invested with this bank? No, you just lost it all. Then please stand aside for people who actually have money with us. Next, please. Credible sources made it clear, which is why you should always keep your money in cash under your mattress or just gold buried in the woods. 
credible sources made it clear with their messaging that this had the potential to be a major crisis if it wasn't averted, but they were much less clear what that crisis was going to be. Important people would show up on the news to talk about the threat of Y2K, like the head of IBM, military personnel, addressing the country directly from the Pentagon, and even Spock himself, Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> All right, Leonard. <laughs> What are you up to? I mean, I get that you played Spock, but when the head of IBM and like someone from the Pentagon is saying something, it's like, well, yeah, those guys are like, they're like big brains. Spock's an actor. Well, Spock's a Vulcan. Leonard Nimoy's an actor. My work is done here. You didn't do anything. <laughs> Didn't I? Of course, Nimoy also hosted a show that did things like Hunt for Bigfoot, so he may not have been as credible a news source as my nerd brain wants to believe. Yeah, William doesn't William Shatner now host a show about like searching for aliens or something, which is disappointing because there's no aliens, and I love William Shatner. He was in. I don't love him because of Star Trek. I wasn't a fan of the original Star Trek. He was in a show called Boston Legal, which I think is one of the best shows that was ever made. But all these people came on TV to warn us of the impending danger without actually stating what that danger was. This gave the media free license to spout whatever the hell nonsense they felt like, and they absolutely did this, resulting in panic. There's nothing going to happen. What are you basing that on? Nobody knows. Chicken noodle. They've stocked their shelves with soups. Chicken noodle. There were claims that banks would lose all their money, the power grid would shut down, shortages, there would be global food shortages, planes would fall out of the sky, nuclear missiles would launch themselves, there would be massive civil wars, and worst of all, your Fallout 2 save file would delete itself. Well, good news, you're now living in Fallout. People were terrified, so they had to prepare for the worst, and in America, preparing for the worst means one thing and one thing only, build a bunker and fill it with guns and ammo. And that is exactly what people did. Harkening back to the Cold War, people began building survival bunkers or even fallout shells as if they could afford it. After all, who knew where those nukes were going to fall after they launched themselves? <laughs> There was a run on guns, ammo, water, and any food that would keep long enough to weather the mayhem that was sure to follow. People also withdrew massive amounts of cash for fear that the banks would collapse, and many bought backup generators for when the power inevitably went out across the world. As much as I'd want to dunk on all of these people as survivalist nut jobs, it's actually hard to blame them. Trusted sources <laughs> like Spock were saying that there was a real problem. Without it being clear about the actual dangers that this problem posed, and the media took advantage of it to generate fear for ratings. <laughs> I can't believe the media would do something like that. It's so out of character and outrageous. The media is this trusted institution that always gets it right and never chases views. <laughs> I mean, I, look, I get there's hypocrisy here, but at least I'm f***ing honest about it. God, that coffee is just so cold. It didn't help that the average person was also largely computer illiterate either. PCs had become common, but most people knew little more about them than how to type in Microsoft Word or log, log on to AOL. And why would they? We all know how to use a remote control, but how many of you understand the inner workings of your television? Computers are integrated into so many aspects of our lives these days that the average person probably has a better understanding of how they work than most electronics in their life. But that wasn't the case in the 1990s. Do people really know how that sh works? I just think they're like, it's a magical window. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I mean, I probably have a vague idea. Like there's ones and zeros, then there's programs, there's hard disks, there's RAMs, there's motherboards, there's graphics cards, there's displays and input devices and all of this shit. But it's like, it, I think most people are like, it's a magical window. <laughs> Woo! I touch it and it does things. That's a little gay. Hold on. All most people knew was that computers were a key component of a lot of the world's most important infrastructure, and there was a good chance that it was all going to go to hell. It really did happen. When the year 2000 hit, the world really did feel the consequences of the dreaded Y2K bug. Since time zones are a thing, the mayhem naturally began in Japan, where just seconds after midnight, alarms started blaring at the Shika nuclear power plants in Ishikawa. Uh-oh! <laughs> And that's how the uh, Shika nuclear disaster became so famous. Oh wait, no it didn't. Everything's fine. At this point, I should probably mention that the majority of the consequences of Y2K were more of a nuisance than anything actually serious. The equipment that monitored the radiation in the power plant malfunctioned as a result of the date change, but it was a false alarm and the plant itself was fine. Okay, okay, don't panic. Whatever problem this is, I'm sure they know how to handle it. But not all of the consequences were so frightening. For example, in Hong Kong, the police force breathalyzers all stopped working at midnight. <laughs> ah, <laughs> considering New Year's Day as the highest rate of drunk drive. <coughs> Excuse me. 
the highest rate of drunk driving, the police probably found this to be less than ideal, while the citizens couldn't have been happier. Maybe not all of them, but definitely the ones that drive better when they're drunk. That's such an American thing to say. It does amaze me how blasé people are about drink driving in America. Like, just in general, they're like, Yeah, we just had a couple of beers. I'm fine. Is that okay? In Germany, one man thought he struck it rich when he received a statement including a transfer of $6.2 million into his bank account. Of course, he probably knew he wasn't going to get to keep this money when he saw that date on the statement, which read De- uh, December the 30th, 1899. Incorrect dates being printed on things like this was extremely common, with hundreds of thousands of receipts worldwide shown in the year 1900 instead of 2000s. Computer recorded babies as being 100 years old, and a 105-year-old woman in Norway was offered a spot at local daycare free because her birth year had been incorrectly updated to 1990 instead of 1894. As a side note, how crazy must life have been for that woman? She was born in the same year that cornflakes were invented and the element argon was discovered, and yet she lived to see computers almost destroy the world. Yeah, but I think we're going to see even more crazy shit. Like, I think in our lifetimes we're going to just see so much crazy shit. Hopefully, if we live long. Hopefully, I'll live long. There are a bunch of other examples of things that went wrong, but like I said, it was almost pr- always pretty minor stuff like credit card machines or ATMs not working for a day or two. One of the more major problems occurred in Jamaica, where eight traffic lights at major intersections stopped working. Officials knew that the computerized lights weren't Y2K compliant. They just didn't particularly care. <laughs> Could make a joke about Jamaica, couldn't I? But that'd be a, probably a bit racist. Jamaica's the one where they smoke lots of weed, right? Is that... I, it's a stereotype, right? It's a stereotype. Someone don't lean into stereotypes. It's not nice. It's not nice. Do it. But they do smoke. <laughs> Dig it all. And I'm also not saying like everyone who smokes weed is like less productive. But they are right. If you smoke weed, you're not getting you're not getting all your done as much as you as you could, right? Are you challenging me? <laughs> They'd been scheduled to be replaced, it just wasn't deemed important enough to get it done before the new year. Interestingly enough, not all manufacturing systems were caught immediately. In a lot of cases, the errors were so minor that nobody was going to notice there might be a problem until the clocks read March the 1st instead of February 29th. You hopefully know that every year that's divisible by four is a leap year. <laughs> didn't know that. <laughs> I just <laughs> I just assumed that people decided it was like every four years or whatever. Right, well, that's how it works. I just I just rely on someone telling me that every year. What you may not know is that a year divisible by 100, which is also divisible by 4, is not a leap year unless it's also divisible by 400. Oh my god, Kevin, I didn't know that, and I also don't care. So 1900 wasn't a leap year, but 2000 was. This meant that a lot of organizations around the world were using computers that thought the year was 1900 and nobody noticed until two months later on leap day. Final thoughts. So in the end, after years of being told by the media that the world was going to end, nothing happened. But that's not because there wasn't ever a threat. The dangers of Y2K were likely overblown as nuclear missiles weren't going to randomly start launching themselves. But a lot of the fears were very real. This wasn't some ridiculous doomsday prophecy from a fortune teller. It was a technological concern based on computers that were known to have been poorly programmed and should already have been upgraded years earlier. The fact that there weren't any major problems isn't because the whole thing was a sham. It's because of the concerted effort taken by governments corporations around the world to ensure that the issue is dealt with beforehand. And this was not a small undertaking. I mentioned at the beginning that it was estimated that the damages caused by Y2K could have reached $600 billion. It would have been a lot more if those nuclear missiles started popping off. But the worldwide cost to prevent said damages was still over $300 billion. If they hadn't put the work in, there's no telling what would have happened, but definitely not nuclear missile strikes. Looking back, though, it's really crazy to think about all of this. I know you're a little younger than me, Simon. That's right. But I'm sure you must remember all the craziness leading up to Y2K. I do. It makes me... People were told there's a millennium bug, I think is what we call it. It makes me think of the 105-year-old woman who was offered a spot at daycare. We grew up in a time when limitations of computer storage could also have done serious damage to society, but now I can order a terabyte hard drive online with same-day delivery for under $40. Yeah, it's crazy. Why would you buy a terabyte hard drive, though? <laughs> <laughs> How, that's tiny. Like, I know, I'm buying, they're more expensive than $40, but generally the hardest about like 16 terabytes. Granted, I do make a lot of videos, so there's a lot of data storage, but that, yeah, it's pretty standard. I buy like a 16 terabyte one, it gets full. I buy another 16 terabyte one. Soon I'll be buying 32 terabytes, I'm sure. People in 10 years watching this video will be like, 32 terabytes. <laughs> you peasant. It's not quite the same as the leap from cornflakes to the f- 
fucking internet, but I can only imagine how far technology will advance by the time I'm 105. It's the sort of thing that could cause an existential crisis, but luckily I'll never have to worry about it. I do stupid enough sh I'm shocked I made it to 40, so there's no chance of living to be 105. And that's where we end today's video. Thank you for watching. Hello, everybody. Let's try and solve the better.